Thank you very much. Uh, this is the first uh, breakout session following uh, the plenary session. And it is designed to, to then have, uh, get, uh, let people have actually had experience implementing this uh, to hear from them. Uh, when I look back when we started, uh, gosh, when I started with the National Center in 2001, and we started working on court tools, and we got the court tools done around 2005, and those of us that were working on it says, these are great court tools, where do they fit? So then we started working on the international, on the high performance court framework, which really came about 2010. At the same time, I was involved uh, uh, with PIM and some others with the internet and uh, uh, with uh, the folks from Singapore in developing uh, the international framework. So these things were kind of going in the same, the same route. Uh, and if looking back, you know, it is, you know, it's very short lived. I mean, it's only been oh, about uh, you know nine years for the international framework and probably eight years for the high performance court. And so we're learning how to do this. I think we're still learning how to walk with this. And I think, as I look forward to hearing from our panelists, I think we can start to see the lessons that, uh, that uh, uh, we're starting to learn from the implementation. Uh, this is not easy, I think, as, this, as we have talked before. Uh, what we hope to do is go through you know, each panelist's presentations. Uh, I'm going to ask a few questions that we have time, and then we'll hopefully leave time for you all to also answer questions. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jennifer, and we'll just kind of go Jennifer, Christine, um, um, uh, with Kevin and and then Danielle. Great. Good afternoon. It's a privilege to be on this panel, and I like to thank Dan, who was instrumental in getting me to participate in this session. Now, as mentioned earlier, I'm the deputy presiding judge, as well as the registrar of the state courts. Now, the state courts. For those of you who are not familiar with the state courts of Singapore. We are courts of a first instance that handle around 90% of the caseload in Singapore. Now, in my capacity as registrar, as and as well as the deputy presiding judge, I perform both judicial and administrative functions. Now, at the earlier plenary, we had heard from the panel about the holistic self-assessment framework, that is the IFCE. And my presentation will be focused on the state courts in using the IFCE and our recent tweaks that we have made uh, to, the, to the framework. We are not up there challenging uh, like what the high performing courts had sought to do with the framework, but we are, all I can say is that we have tried to improve and further refine the framework. The framework as a holistic tool, as most of you should know, covers in multiple areas of court excellence and is focused on continuous improvement. Now through our regular workshops, Through our regular workshops, we have conducted a number of workshops with judiciaries of Namibia and worked together with our Singapore Judicial College in working with judiciaries in the ASEAN, Cambodia, Laos, PDR, Myanmar, Thailand, and Vietnam. And sharing with our counterparts, we have found that there is continued interest and utility of the IFCE in courts in our part of the world as well as what we've heard today in this part of the world as well. Now, the IFCE, as you have heard, is a flexible tool, and courts may need to adapt the framework to suit their needs. The District Courts of New Zealand and Australian tribunals are two examples of jurisdictions that have embraced and adapted the framework. Now, judiciaries are a key pillar of society, and we aim to make our organization better by delivering quality judgments, ensuring that the court processes are robust, and delivering excellent court services. Now, we live in a dynamic world, and it is imperative that our courts continuously navigate for the future. And that's what we do in the state courts of Singapore. As we plan ahead, it's also important that we keep in mind a longer term view and look towards building a sustainable future. Now, as what Dan had sh uh, shared earlier about the journey of the US courts, the NCSC, in coming to, uh, to finding a framework, the state court's journey started in earnest in 2001. This was years before the International Consortium for Court Excellence was formed, which was formed in 2007. 
We looked around and we couldn't find a framework that was effective, a model that suited the justice sector. Or what we relied on was the business excellence quality framework. But with the coming together of the Consortium for Court Excellence and the framework, we had now a framework that had criteria that was tailored, designed for courts, and it was something that we could embrace. Since then, the, courts, the state courts have conducted two self-assessments in 2012 and in 2015. It has served as a yardstick that provides an objective evaluation of the effectiveness of the state courts. From the two rounds of self-assessment that we conducted, of course, we did rather well and, and our bending was almost at the top. We gained more experience in administering the self-assessment surveys. We considered the results of the self-assessment and developed action plan for areas of improvement, implementation and evaluation. Whilst the results were very encouraging, we did not let the results go to our head because we, were, we, we, were recon we recognised the fact that we were evaluating or assessing our own officers were giving the feedback as part of the panel. In January 2016, we organised a conference on court excellence, and at this conference, we had a lot of we had distinguished speakers. Dan was there from the US, Australia, and New Zealand. They gave us much food for thought about the work that they had been doing with the framework, and this made us reflect more deeply on, uh, on our own experience of using the framework. So we then decided to systematically review the framework. And, during, and also because of the feedback that we had received from our judges and court administrators, questioning why, for example, some aspects of our work was not effectively reflected in the framework. We had gone a big way into corporate social responsibility and ethics, and this was not something that was found. And there was this discussion as to whether or not our court annex mediation, that particular process, should also be referred to in the framework. So whilst at the same time the IFC criteria statements served as a good base for the courts, there are certain fundamentals that should not, which should not be changed. We set about considering what are the criteria statements that could be enhanced. One particular aspect that we focused on was our review of our people. The development of our people is a long-term strategy for our courts and it must also be understood against the broader context of Singapore and the ch changes domestically as well as globally. Now, Singapore has around 3.9 million residents and about another 1.7 million persons who form the remainder of non-residents. In 2013, the government released a white paper on population trends. The white paper projected the total population in 2030 to be between 6.5 and 6.9 million. It anticipated that there will be an upgrading of Singaporean workforce towards professional, managerial, executive and technical jobs. In addition to these changes in the structure of our population, we also recognise that technology will continue to impact on our daily lives and work. More countries were turning on to, to automation to increase productivity and to address changes in the structure of the workforce and the types of job. Jobs that exist today will very likely not be the same in 10 years' time, or perhaps even sooner. Now, as data analytics and artificial intelligence technology continues to develop, this creates opportunities for legal services to be delivered. I have three examples, but I will only focus on one because of time constraint. This is our latest initiative, the latest IT system that came online just yesterday. An online filing case management system for tribunal meetings. For small claims, parties have the ability to e-negotiate regardless of their physical location. They could settle a settlement in secure confidential platform before parties come to court. When a settlement offer is made by the respondent, the claimant will receive a notification to log on and to consider the offer and the counter offer. If a settlement is reached, they may, parties may apply for an online tribunal order from the system. Now, why did I mention this initiative? Apart from the fact that I'm very thrilled by the fact that we have just been able to roll it out, and, and the fact that this was like the first time in, that, in our region that something like this has been, is available. 
How it relates to IFCE and my presentation today? Well, these developments bring new opportunities to carry out work in a more innovative and productive way. At the same time, they bring a whole new host of issues that need to be addressed. The key challenges for the state court is how to prepare our judges and court administrators to adapt to the changes and excel in the new operating environment. There is a need to acquire new technical skills and to change the mindset. Now, all this, I'm sure, sounds very familiar to you. When courts first began to use electronic filing, we also recognize the need to acquire new skills and change the mindsets of our officers. So what might happen, what might be different here, is the pace at which change might happen and the extent and the type of changes that we anticipate that will take place. This will no doubt worry some of our offices and we need to build capacity and build resilience in our offices. Now, returning to the model, what we decided, and this is copies of this booklet, will, will be made available sparingly because we, didn't, we weren't able to carry that many copies here. We have enhanced the criteria statements that relate to the development of our court workforce. I'm only focusing on one area. In addition to managing workload and paying attention to training and development needs, we have broadened the scope and introduced several new criteria statements on people development. As routine functions are increasingly automated, that's a greater need for officers to perform roles at a higher level. Roles that require human factor and that cannot be automated. This includes strong legal knowledge to handle complex cases, soft skills such as interpersonal communication and managing people, which have always been important, are important for organizations to excel. Officers also need to have a strong sense of ethical behavior behavior that serves as guideposts when they encounter gray areas. Part of the sustainability in implementing change also means looking after the development and welfare of our offices. We became increasingly aware of the importance of judicial well-being, and the Singapore Judicial College has conducted a training program on this topic. Our courts also need to develop a conducive environment in which to work and foster work-life balance. At organizational level, policies and good practices need to be implemented that promote the well-being of our offices. And these are some of the criteria statements that we had put in place. I won't go through them because it is in part of my presentation and the slides are at your disposal. So at the heart of it, managing people effectively must start with the organization's leadership. That is why in 2016, we began to develop an executive leadership program for court and tribunal administrators. The first run of this program took place in January this year, and the state courts will run a, a similar program next year in February. Again, we will share with you some of the flyers, and if those of you who want to leave the harsh cold weather in the US, you're most welcome to attend this conference, this program. Now, the state courts, of course, periodically conducts employee engagement services. We put in place all these efforts about trying to enhance the workforce, but we need to know whether we are actually hitting the target. So the employment engagement survey takes place about once every two years to allow employees to adapt to the changes and to avoid survey fatigue. We don't do it annually. And such surveys are very important. It gives us an opportunity to understand the feedback and for the leadership to engage the organization and to address any concerns that they have. Now, I have focused just on one aspect. It's a key feature that I talked about, and this slide actually gives you an overview of some of the areas uh, that we have tweaked. Now, I'd like to conclude with some learning points and observations from our self-assessment and experience gained from collaborating with other judiciaries. I have already highlighted the fact that we had worked with the High Court of Namibia and the Administrative Court of Thailand. Leadership of the organization demonstrates the commitment to undertaking the self-assessment. More broadly, leadership plays a role in building a culture of continuous imp improvement. It is important that the leadership communicates the objectives of the framework and self-assessment so that judges and staff are aligned to understand the purpose of the exercise. But we, in our view, it, this should not be only within the province of the APEX leadership. 
Court administrators should be encouraged to be leaders within their own sphere of influence to bring about positive change, improving court processes and promoting innovation within an organisation. Some of the challenges that courts continue to face in implementing certain processes may require human and budgetary resources and this has been our experience when we are talking with some of the ASEAN jurisdictions. And one of the strategies is for them to have an opportunity to share information. Conferences of this nature allow that access to information which otherwise may not necessarily be uh, available to them. So it is also important that conferences of this nature are marketed and priced at, a at, at the right price if you wish to encourage countries from third worlds to attend this as well. Now, many courts have also introduced video conferencing through Skype. So you don't need to have very expensive options. You could look for cheaper options. Looking towards the horizon, court needs to keep abreast of new developments and trends that will impact the courts. Changes in society and population demographics. Is society aging? Or is it a young, vibrant workforce? How do we manage the retention of older offices and manage the expectations of career advancement of the young? How will this impact on the delivery of court services. I've already touched on the rapid development in IT and how will this impact on jobs in the future? Public communication and access to information. How do we deal with the ever-growing role of the social media and managing fake news? As I mentioned at the start of my presentation, we are committed to leading our organizations to greater height in court excellence. The IFC provides a multi-dimensional tool that enables courts to take a holistic approach to improving themselves. The state courts have sought to enhance the framework so that it can serve our courts better. We have done so by ex understanding the external changes in environment and the trends that we can see and anticipating where the opportunities are. This is in line with our long-term strategy to build capacity and resilience in our court workhouse with a goal towards achieving sustainable court excellence. Okay, I was carried away and I didn't <laughs> press all these bullet points. <laughs> all right, but again, you will have this. And this is the, the model, and you would be able to get copies. The soft copy will be downloaded on the State Courts website as well as the IFCE website after this conference. All right, thank you. Good afternoon, dear colleagues and dear friends. I'm saying friends because it's my fourth time. I'm um, attending IACA conference, and every time I was going back to my country, to Moldova, with a lot of new knowledge, with a lot of enthusiasm. And um, uh, my presentation today is going to be about um, what I learned in 2014 at the IACA conference in Sydney. Uh, but, uh, so my presentation is going to be about implementation of the um, IFC in the Republic of Moldova. To give you a brief context, uh, Moldova is a country located between Ukraine and Romania with a population about 4 million people. We started implementing the IFC in 2015 uh, when we had 51 courts. Uh, since then, uh, we are undergoing a massive court optimization effort, and out of 51, we have 19 courts now. Uh, but IFC was implemented in three of them. So as I was saying, going back uh, the memory line in 2014, I was listening to the presentation of my Australian colleagues about how interesting it was for some Australian courts to implement IFC, and what an eye-opening and um, encouraging experience it was for them to uh, see what areas they can improve in. I came back and started to convey that enthusiasm to uh, the Moldovan Judicial Council. Uh, they somehow believed me, you know, it's something good for the country. <laughs> Um, and they decided, uh, let's try it, why not? Uh, we are not a big country, we can do it. Uh, so they selected three courts, uh, two district courts um, and one appellate court. And you can see the pictures of these courts um, on the screen. 
Uh, the pilot courts were uh, different size and different located in different regions. The pilot court had 15 judges and about uh, 40 court staff. Uh, one district court had uh, only four judges located up north, um, and another one had um, nine judges and about 15 court staff. Uh, we deliberately selected different uh, geographic areas just because although it's a small country, uh, you can really feel different challenges in different parts of the country. We are really lucky to have uh, a good friend of ours. I will name him, he's Pim Albers. <laughs> we contracted him, he came to Moldova, and he helped us uh, realize and understand what IFC is. And uh, with his help, we conducted uh, the first stage um, for this pilot courts. On site, we trained them on workshops about IFCE, the seven areas of court excellence. It was for the first time the courts actually learned and understood they can do something about this. There is no need to wait until the Judicial Council tells them that something has to be changed. So that was the first uh, step. The second step was an intensive court self-assessment, which uh, was around those seven areas of the IFCE. And uh, uh, the team, uh, there was a steering committee in each of the pilot court that went through extensive questionnaires and uh, comparing answers and scoring or rating on uh, the um, uh, level of performance of their own court in each of this area. Uh, then uh, um, after that exercise, uh, we didn't, they didn't stop there. They conducted two very intensive internal and external surveys. The internal survey was very interesting. It was uh, an anonymous um, court, e court employee survey. It was online. So the court employees answered very genuinely and candidly about how they feel working in that particular court, what they really think about the court manager and the court president, and uh, <laughs> what they want to be changed in that court. Um, out of the three um, courts, one particular court president was not very happy about what <laughs> the results of uh, the um, um, opinions or the opinions of the court staff, but it was really an eye-opening experience, and uh, it actually triggered a lot, of, a lot of attitude change from that particular court president towards the staff and towards the leadership that that court president was showing. Uh, and the external survey was a baseline court user survey, which was done uh, during two weeks, um, uh, volunteered uh, court staff and uh, some uh, students from the local faculties, law faculties, came in and they were uh, handing out court surveys and interviewing court goers. And then at the end of the piloting, we did another survey. Uh, I need to tell you that uh, it was a very quick uh, time frame, a very short time frame, I would say, for this IFC implementation in Moldova. It only lasted nine months, or nine or ten months, uh, January to October 2015. Um, and uh, we just wanted to try whether it's going to work, what the results would be. And plus, it was um, with some financial support from the USAID. Uh, uh, rule of law project at that time, uh, which you understand it, it's always an incentive because you, you have uh, funds for the consultants, you can have m different materials. We actually even um, organized some study visits to the US and Europe for the um, uh, pilot court team to see how it is to have an excellent court. Uh, and then as a result of all this, the courts developed their action plans. Uh, I won't go into a lot of details because uh, all the courts had their own challenges. Very unique challenges, by the way. Uh, I was really curious to see the differences. It's the same countries, but like really different set of challenges and what they did about it. But uh, the main shifts were that um, all of a sudden people working together realized that they just don't work in one, under one roof. They actually can be a team and they can actually work together to solve some issues. Uh, they realize there is no need to wait until the judicial leadership tells you to change something in your court. You can actually do it, start doing it. Um, which leads to the second the shift, uh, bottom-up approach to reforms does work. Um, also quite a revelation for some courts was what the court goers think about the services of the court. It actually, uh, what, uh, the um, uh, opinions were more positive than they expected, which was good, it was encouraging. The work climate, as I mentioned to you, in two of the courts were okay, in one not so well, but it was um, a good uh, baseline assessment. 
Uh, and uh, oh, it was also empowering. The teams felt that they know where they are and what, what they, where they want to get from where they were. They were. Uh, so they developed strategies for the courts, which went really beyond the nine months or ten months of implementation. Uh, they were monitoring performance a lot closer. We do have performance dashboard, automatic performance dashboards in Moldova, which were used sporadically, but after this they became a lot more institutionalized. Uh, customer, service, uh, customer service was seriously improved after the uh, surveys. A uh, higher level of court staff satisfaction because court presidents actually took that, uh, the results very seriously. And uh, they were setting and sticking to high quality standards. What I'm telling you was uh, what I was telling last year at the same conference in, in The Hague uh, in, uh, about the results of this IFCE. That project, your CD project, finished. Uh, there was no mo more money. So what do we do now? Was it sustainable? That was the interesting question. So as, uh, as I was preparing for this presentation, I uh, got in touch with the three pilot courts. Some of them were uh, fused in or merged in the newly created courts under the court optimization exercise. But uh, there are some big wins for the Moldovan judiciary out of these three pilot courts under IFC. One was that there were some templates developed, available uh, online for the court users and the court staff, which all Moldovan citizens can benefit from. Uh, the court implementation teams tried. They are not doing it regularly, but they are getting into the habit of meeting at least quarterly and checking where they are. So it takes some time to, to um, change the mentality and the approach, but it is happening. They're still doing it. Uh, the court user surveys are really a uh, reality already. Uh, it's a fact of life in at least in two of the pilot courts. They're doing it uh, twice a year, beginning and end of the year. They said without this, they don't know what they're doing wrong or right, which is good. Uh, and also one of the courts printed a one pager about the court and the main contact information and where can people pay their fines. It was a very user friendly um, leaflet that they were giving out. And they noticed that because of this, the public officer got a lot less um, inquiries from people. They were just handing out this and it was very good. So it's, it's a great practice. And also the mass media um, felt as if they are more welcomed in these courts. Uh, now the future. Uh, the future is that there is another USAID funded project that just started <laughs> and I'm working on that project now and um, with the full support of the Moldovan Judicial Council we would like to take IFC implementation to a nationwide level. So unt until the fall of 2018 we would like to run this through all um, 19 newly created courts. And uh, also, we have really big plans about using ICT or uh, IT technology, the IT, uh, to put it to the service of the public and of the courts in Moldova, and to help I increase the level of performance and uh, service of the courts. And I would like to finish with um, the last uh, uh, phrase, which was the motto for the IFC implementation in Moldova. We are what we repeatedly, repeatedly do. The excellence, therefore, is not an act, but a habit. It was not me who said this, <laughs> but it's, it's, a, <laughs> it's a great phrase that um, uh, we are trying to uh, inspire all Moldovan courts to follow in the future. Thank you very much for your attention. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Kevin Bowling, uh, and I'm with Ottawa County, Michigan, uh, as a court administrator there. Um, as I go through and tell you a little bit about our experience with the high performance court framework, um, I'd like to provide you with a reality check. And the reality check, I'm going to ask at least three people that are sitting back here to raise their hands because they are top level administrators in our court. So if you don't believe anything that I tell you this afternoon, you can check it out with them tonight. But we have our probate court administrator, our, uh, our juvenile court administrator, and our trial division director, um, Sandy Metcalf and Penny DeWitt and Becky Rowden, who are back here as well. So they've lived through what I'm going to try to describe a little bit to you right now. Um, we had this title that was given uh, to us in, present, uh, in preparation for the presentations today about traveling a path. And that's really what uh, our experience has been 
Um, it has been a path that when I first got to the court where we are in Ottawa County, it was about 15 years ago. Um, when I came into the court as the court administrator there, I realized there had not been a lot of long-term or organizational-wide planning, strategic planning, or other uh, assessments done. Most of our divisional operations worked in silos, as they do in, in many courts in, in the United States, uh, where folks focus on their own caseload, their own particular type of work, and don't necessarily compare notes or uh, look at data across courts. So because of my involvement in NACOM, I wanted to look at the NACOM then core competencies, now the new core that's available. And based on this core, you can see that one of our responsibilities as court leaders is to develop and promote a strategic vision uh, for the court. Um, and there's a lot of information about how we do that but it involves bringing all of the key players, the stakeholders, uh, together. And when we started to do that right away, now we're going back to 2003, 2004, um, as I mentioned, I had just come to the court after spending a year of working with courts in Nigeria um, with the National Center on a project. Um, and I, I came back and we started to develop a strategic plan. And the core of that plan with our, our mission um, is to administer justice and restore wholeness in a manner that inspires public trust, which sounds great as a mission statement, but how do you know if you're doing it? How do you know if you're being successful? What kind of evidence can you show to your judges, to your court staff, to your community that these things are happening and that we are living out that mission? Um, after 15 years of doing this, you can go to most of our judges, most of our court staff, and they can recite this mission for you. Um, they understand what it is that we're trying to do because we've laid that out and we wanted to move forward with it, and we saw a lot of benefits that came to our court as a result of it. Long-term and court-wide thinking and planning, um, enhanced communication, involved and engaged staff, um, providing court leadership with a roadmap so anybody could see clearly where we were going. But after we had done this for a few years and engaged our, our, our court stakeholders, our community, using a number of the tools that were referred to in the plenary session from the court tools, including internal court employee satisfaction surveys and external access and fairness surveys and a variety of other tools, um, we got to a point perhaps 10 years in to this strategic planning effort where we thought we were ready to move to the next level. And as we started looking around, the high performance court framework seemed to us to be a very natural progression. Uh, it was something that we had done. Um, our leadership team uh, in the court was ready to, to raise that bar a little bit. Uh, and we wanted to be very thoughtful about how we approached it and where we we're going next. So we approached uh, the State Justice Institute. They kindly gave us a, a grant to partner with the National Center for State Courts. And we looked at this renewed emphasis on performance measures. Now, in the state of Michigan, where we are, our Supreme Court um, had not previously been involved in gathering a lot of information uh, regarding performance measures. But at the same time, we were working on this effort uh, Michigan as a state with nearly 10 million uh, people in population, 244 different trial courts, organized through 83 different counties, started really looking carefully at performance measures, uh, and they were very interested in the lead that we were taking uh, as well with this. So we were trying to figure out how do you look at, from a court administration perspective, um, selection of good performance in indicators. So we wanted to look at things that were linked to key principles, things that were balanced, measurable. It's already been mentioned here, the question of sustainability. If we, if we create the beast, can we feed the beast and keep it going uh, into the future? Clear focus on outcomes. Um, and, and looking at, rather than dozens or hundreds of performance measures, what are the feasible, meaningful, 
practical few measures that are going to make a difference in your jurisdiction. So there's a lot of things that can be measured, um, and there are a lot of things that matter, but you're looking for that overlap in terms of getting to a specific performance measure. And that was one of the things that we liked about um, resources that had recently become available through the high performance court framework, um, looking at the four capitals that they had described in that document with organizations, human capital, technological capital, information capital, and then also looking at a focus on public trust and confidence in the courts and, and trying to develop uh, the support of authorities that are involved in overseeing and, and funding court operations. So those were you know, important areas, and I think Danielle's going to touch on this a little bit further uh, in her presentation. But baked within the high performance court framework, there's also this concept of a balanced scorecard. Um, again, looking at what are the right measures to tell us how we're doing. Are we achieving excellence? Are we improving? Um, and some of the areas that we looked at with the, um, the, the balanced scorecard of effectiveness, efficiency, procedural satisfaction, and productivity, we focused on four areas to begin, and then we started to develop from there. So with our effectiveness, we looked at court collections. How are we doing in terms of the ratio between what's being ordered by the judges in the court and what's actually being collected. And this is something that our local funding units for the court are particularly interested in. From the courtroom perspective and efficiency, looking at clearance rates. Are we taking care of business? Are we moving cases through the court system in a timely, efficient, effective way and getting the job done for the people that are coming in? That was important. Procedural satisfaction was, was scored or measured by looking at a public survey of court users. And then we also, as I mentioned earlier, looked at employee satisfaction. Uh, I think Matt Kleiman in the plenary session talked a little bit about the, the connection or the nexus between happy and satisfied court employees and how well we're treating the public or getting the job done. So that was a very important measure to us and, and frankly, one of the hardest ones for us to implement. Because when we asked employees for their opinion, they gave it to us. Um, a lot of it was good, but there were a lot of areas where we needed to improve. And we have worked consistently on doing that. So from our perspective, I think it was mentioned again in the plenary that there are a lot of different ways to do business and to look at performance in the courts. But from our perspective, we saw the high performance court framework giving us a comprehensive management approach, allowing us to move from performance measures to performance management. Again, it's the old adage um, that you can't manage what you can't count. So we have to make sure that we've got some kind of evidence that shows us how we're doing, and then it provides us a way to diagnose and solve problems. Rather than waiting for something to blow up and become a problem, we could actually look ahead and figure out where our areas are. And then just to wrap up in terms of our experience, some of the lessons that we learned along the way is that the culture, which was talked about earlier this morning, needs to support and sustain the strategic plan. One person cannot do it. It has to be institutionalized within the culture of the court you may begin with one or two or three cheerleaders that are going to drive the innovation forward, but eventually you have to get everybody on board or it won't be sustainable. We have to invest the necessary time. In our situation, we have a variety of strategic initiatives that are going on, and we have court staff from all levels, from the judges right down to the frontline clerks that are directly involved with some of our strategic action teams. Um, and they're provided time by their supervisors to engage in meetings, to work on projects, and that type of thing. Setting attainable goals was critical for us. Um, coming out of the gates, I was charged up and I was ready to race forward, and I had hundreds of things I wanted to see done overnight. At one point, 
my chief judge came to me and we had a little reality conversation. And he pulled in the reins a little bit and said, slow down. People can't accept all of this change at once. Let's do a few things and do it very well. And then there will be added um, interest in moving forward. We found it very helpful to use an outside facilitator, and I think that was mentioned in the Moldova experience. Um, Pim, you served that role. We also brought in an outside facilitator that was very helpful in our process to, to jumpstart the process. And explicitly linking projects and practices to the mission statement in our experience was very important. Making sure that any time I walked up to any one of a couple of hundred staff members looked at what they were doing and saying, tell me how that helps us administer justice or restore wholeness in a manner that inspires public trust. If they couldn't explain the connection to me, my question is, why are you doing what you're doing? Maybe we ought to stop it until we figure out what the connection is with our strategic plan, with our mission, and how this is going to help us be a higher performing court and always keeping an eye on the big picture. That was something that was very important to us. Our experience may not be the same in every court. I'm assuming that everyone would do things a little bit differently, but what I can tell you is that over time, we found the high-performing court framework a very important add-on to our strategic planning process. It provided some additional focus, some additional um, uh, ways to explain to our stakeholders why we were doing what we were doing and providing the evidence uh, to back it up. So we found it very helpful. We think we're doing better uh, and we're always looking at ways to improve, which is why we keep coming to NACOM conferences uh, and ICA conferences so that we can learn from all of you as well and hopefully uh, improve even further. Thank you. Good afternoon. As Stan mentioned, my name is Danielle Fox. I'm a researcher at Montgomery County Circuit Court in Maryland. This Maryland trial court is located in the most populous county in the state with slightly over one million residents. Judges preside over major civil, more serious criminal cases, as well as family and juvenile cases. When I think about our court's ability, and just to clarify, this is supposed to be me, um, and I don't know why I'm self-identifying with um, Homer Simpson, but when I think about our court's ability to apply the framework concepts, I'm pretty optimistic. We have some good pieces in place. We have leadership that supports the use of data to guide decisions. We have staff who engage in a variety of data-related tasks, ranging from quality assurance, um, to analysis and utilization and systems and applications in place to support staff in those tasks. Now that said, some days my ability to apply framework concepts, measurement, monitoring, talking about performance results and accountability, it can get a little awkward. Um, it's, it's uncomfortable in some instances, and it's really uncomfortable when there are expectations around those words, expectations that those words are to be demonstrated by staff at all levels of the organization. So while most days I can get dizzy with excitement about the high performance court framework, for those awkward moments, I'm happy to have the framework in hand to put those uncomfortable words in the appropriate court context. So unlike some of my panel members, my court's experience with the framework is a bit more informal. Since I've been there over the past 10 years, I don't remember us having a conversation in any formal way about the framework concepts. That said, there, uh, it's been clear to me that a vision has existed um, to build up the court's resources in a way that support framework concepts. And those free resources are the court's capital. As Kevin mentioned, the human, the information, the technology, the organizational assets of the courts whose value is realized in their ability to carry out and practically apply the court's mission. So some of our framework strategies in order to be successful on this journey has, has focused on acknowledging that data is a value of the organization. Now for us, we've demonstrated this through the development of a quality control department at our court, ensuring the accuracy of the data, hiring researchers and business analysts, 
ensuring users are engaged in the improvement process, being able to identify the questions we want answered, the data we need to answer those questions, and the corrective actions that need to be put in place based on the answers to those questions. We also recognize that there are parts of the organization that may be more amenable to change. Now, I'm not saying we only apply framework concepts to those areas of the organization, but maybe we start there. If we can show and demonstrate that success in performance measurement and management, for example, maybe those who are more resistant will be willing to engage. So some of the tools, techniques that we've found useful has been the development of a case management system that allows for the collection and extraction of detailed case, case information, being able to analyze that data and share it in a variety of ways to diverse audiences, having individuals in-house in who can perform those data-related tasks, and if we don't have those individuals in-house, maybe we have individuals who are interested in developing those skills. Or maybe, as everybody said, a number of people said, we go external to the organization. It's about investigating the options that are available to us that exist and getting creative in how we acquire them and apply them. Over the past couple years, we've really focused on the development of, of applications to support staff in the utilization of data in monitoring their operations, figuring out how we craft these solutions in a way that makes data applicable and actionable to the, to the staff, to the managers. So this slide highlights two examples, and I'll run through them, so I'll explain the, the information if it's too difficult to see. But both examples closely follow, follow in line with the framework's quality cycle. Again, we're informally following in line. We're not having a discussion about now it's in time to invoke the quality cycle. But generally, that quality cycle begins with problem identification, collecting and analyzing data to better understand that problem, taking corrective action based on what we've learned, and then monitoring to see if the corrective action has had the intended impact. Now the chart on your left, this is child welfare case processing performance that we monitor in relation to the Maryland Judiciary's time standard and performance goal. That time standard and performance goal is that 100% of these cases reach adjudication or trial within 30 days of the filing or shelter care hearing, so very close to the, the beginning of the case. The problem that we were addressing is that between FY14 and FY15, our performance declined from 81% down to 57%. That is is 43 percentage points below our performance goal. And so we looked at these cases. We compared the case characteristics of FY15 data to FY14 data, sliced and diced the data in a variety of different ways, and we communicated those results to judicial and non-judicial staff. We collaborated on the identification of corrective action, and that corrective action focused on modifying our postponement policy. We also shifted the postponement docket from the administrative judge to our family judge in charge. And then we continued to monitor performance results. We were annually examining case processing performance, and then we increased that to quarterly. And we increased our discussions around those performance results. And now we're closer to where we want to be. So in FY15, we were at 57% of cases within that um, time standard of 30 days. In FY16, we're at 77%. And in FY17, preliminary results are we're at 90%. So we're, as I said, closer to where we want to be with continued monitoring, as it can always shift and change. The second example, the chart on your right, focuses on sentencing guidelines worksheets and among guidelines eligible criminal cases. We had to go around the quality cycle a couple of times before we got closer to where we wanted to be. So just to give you a little background, sentencing guidelines worksheets are a tool that judges use in criminal cases to inform their sentencing decisions. They're also used to inform sentencing policy statewide. Now our performance goal around this aspect of our operations was to have a worksheet completion percentage of 95%. That is 95% of all eligible criminal cases have a completed sentencing guidelines worksheet. As we started to monitor this process more formally, we uncovered some challenges. At the end of each month, when we distributed our worksheet status completion report, we had a large number of cases that didn't have the worksheet complete. Not even done, not even started. And that's the gap, those arrows between the two trend lines, um, one that's difficult to see, but between the two trend lines indicate that gap, the amount of follow-up we needed to do to get closer to our goal. We could have up to a 15 percentage point 
difference in our worksheet completion percentage by the time we distributed that worksheet status report at the end of the month to the time when we uh, completed all of our cleanup that we had to do on incomplete or outstanding worksheet, worksheets. So this was a lot of work that had to be done. There was also variability in addressing those incomplete and outstanding worksheets. Sometimes those worksheets were getting addressed rather quickly, other times not so much. A contributing factor we found to this was our decentralized nature of the management of this aspect of our operations. And what I mean by that is administrative personnel created these worksheet staff status reports, and we distribute the, distributed them every month in the hopes that each judge's chamber, each law clerk would address any incomplete outstanding worksheets rather quickly. You know, it would be their top priority, which was, you know, not the case. It could be up to 15 different law clerks that had to figure out how best to address these incomplete worksheets. And so when we we realized these issues, again, we started with discussions with administrative and judicial personnel. We came to the realize, we had to have the discussion and we had to reaffirm our commitment that this was something we wanted to spend time on. You know, do we even care about this metric, about worksheet completion percentage? Did we want to monitor this aspect of our operations? Thankfully, as a researcher, this was something we wanted to focus on, so that's always positive. Um, so we continued to do that. And, we also realized that we needed administrative support to help in that process. So what we did is we developed an application, a database that merged data from our case management system and the Sentencing Commission, an external agency's data system, so that we could monitor on a daily basis the completion of sentencing guidelines worksheets. We had two administrative personnel who were involved in monitoring worksheet status who coordinated across all the judges' chambers and would follow up with each judge's chambers on any incomplete worksheet on a daily or weekly basis. These individuals also worked with some of our external partners. So now, at the time, at the end of the month, when we distribute our, our report, there's nothing to follow up on. We've exceeded our performance goal. We've been able to address all those outstanding worksheets in a more timely manner, and we've been able to sustain that level of performance for the past year. So some of the lessons we've learned is that it's very important to clarify our performance objectives communicating the reasons behind the metrics that we're going to invest in and be able to support staff in the performance management process. With an interest in using data to inform and guide our decisions, we got to have processes in place that ensure the accuracy of the data. Are we clear we're measuring what we think we're measuring? It's also too important to consider the organizational culture when we're developing and implementing those corrective actions. And even without any formal declaration of our support for the framework, we've been able to find the concepts useful and apply them. So for me, the success with the framework has come down to the people, the information, the technology, and the organizational culture. These are assets we all have that we have to figure out how best to position and support to move us along on our high performance journey. Thank you. Very nice. Uh, we have time for a few questions, if anybody has a question. Um, why, why you're, oh, go ahead. Um, Deputy, grab the Do you have microphone. any suggestions for middle management that you're not in the court administration, but you're running just a unit to implement these? And my second question is, did any, any of you ha encounter, um, ju how do I say this nicely, um, your uh, lead judicial person who was not on board? seems like it was successful because they were on board. What if they're not on board? Oh, you might bring it up. Kevin, you want to? For, for our experience, I think one of the things that many of us as court managers have learned over the years is that one of the key functions of our job is the care and feeding of judges. <laughs> so when, when we looked at it, we didn't have all of our judges necessarily on board or even understanding what it was we were trying to do. So it was a matter of repeatedly going back and saying, here's how this is important to the court as an organization and to you as a judicial officer because promoting excellence, doing a better job, having specific performance metrics ultimately um, not only makes your job easier, but ensures a higher quality of customer service for the people coming into the courts. In Michigan, we have one added advantage, 
in that all of our judges are elected. So every six years, they have to get in front of the public and run for re-election. And this is something that they can also use in a very demonstrable way to show that we have data, we have evidence, that we are doing a good job, we are moving these cases forward, we're doing it in a timely and reasonable fashion, and here's the evidence to prove it. So it's finding whatever it is that is going to be in the decision makers' enlightened self-interest to participate. Any other questions? Yeah. The Peter. Oh. Yeah, it's here. A question uh, for the colleagues from Singapore and Moldova. Uh, we've heard about the differences between IFCE and HPCF, and one that stands out is the emphasis we place on data, data-driven, in the uh, high-performance process. My question is, uh, do you see that as, do we have two different worldviews here, or do you see the uh, IFCE moving towards uh, a data-driven uh, heart in their process. Jennifer? I think perhaps there's a need for some clarification. I don't think, one, it would be accurate to reflect the framework as one that is completely devoid of uh, a data-driven approach. So it, it may not necessarily have that much of data focus or be as prescriptive, for example, for the HBC kind of framework. But like in the state courts, we are driven by data. We do have data which we publish and we have a court charter. And we also, in our annual reports, give the indication of disposition rates, clearance rates. So data is important even if the framework itself doesn't describe or go in detail a particular performance measurement that you should use. Thank you for your question. Um, in the Moldovan context, IFC is a better tool just because um, uh, we are undergoing reforms in the judiciary towards a more proactive society and rule of law promotion. We didn't have it in our culture before, so giving the big picture helps. And the court uh, performance and data is one critical element, but you need to really create a movement before people start looking at the data. You have to infuse them. You have to make them supporters of this, and then the data comes into play. Uh, with that, we're out of time, and please join me in, uh, in thanking our speakers. Thank you very much. <laughs>